think we are almost uh, full house, uh, so we should get it started. Um, just um, one announcement. Um, at the end of this uh, session, we typically have a communique, some kind of declaration. So it'll be a Kampala declaration. And um, uh, there is um, a, a drafting team, uh, and we'll be convening uh, during the break and also uh, at lunch. A couple of requests. Uh, we want this to be as participative as possible. So if you have some key messages, any one of you, if you have key messages, that you think came up at this uh, policy seminar that should go into the declaration, please uh, convey that information to us during the break. Okay? Second, this is the request to uh, presenters. Also, if you think, I don't want you to present that paper again, if you can distill one or two things that you think should be solved to uh, senior African policy makers, you should also let us know um, during the break. Um, by the way, you are all welcome to join the, uh, the drafting team uh, during the break, and I'm talking about the presenters. You're all welcome uh, to actually join uh, that. Um, I really like what transpired yesterday. Uh, the se seminar was conducted in the best of ARC traditions. Uh, policy dialogue, uh, knowledge producers and presenters talking to you, and also you talking to us, and also amongst you. And hence, trying to come up with some kind of collective uh, wisdom uh, and ideas uh, on the imperative of regional integration uh, in Africa. And this dialogue, by the way, did not take place in a vacuum. It was based on knowledge and evidence and it's based on ARC-inspired uh, research and also those who have been affiliated with us. And I expect, uh, by the way, the same today. Um, a couple of variations. Uh, one is that uh, we have included, uh, typically we include presentation from our flagship institutions. So today there will be a presentation from the African Development Bank. Um, let me also point out that uh, this is the first time our senior policy seminar was funded by an African stakeholder. So I wanted to say that the African Development Bank have fully funded the senior policy seminar of rethinking regional integration. So we are very, very pleased about that. And, uh, and I'm going to mention that again towards, to, towards the conclusion. Um, so they then we'll have a, a policy uh, private public uh, round table. It will be uh, headed by um, uh, Governor Louis Kasekende, uh, who is actually our host, and also the chair of, of the ARC board. Here again, um, uh, we're going to kind of bring together some of the things that actually transpired yesterday, and then their own experiences, uh, based on um, the kind of systematic set of early questions, and then intense dialogue amongst themselves, and then we'll have, based on the energy that I observed yesterday, there will be a lot of opportunity for the audience to participate in the policy roundtable as well. So with this, I'm going to uh, move to the next, our uh, first presentation today. There are, by the way, two Bernards. Now there's Bernard the speaker and Bernard the chair. So the chair uh, will, be, uh, will be Governor Bernard Kibise. He is uh, uh, Deputy Governor uh, for uh, uh, financial stability and deepening, um, and very happy, very, and the Bank of Tanzania. In fact, he made it clear to me that it has to be the Bank of Tanzania. Very, very happy. And Bank of and Tanzania, by the way, has also been among the most beneficiaries. And uh, and as you know, Ben Ondulu, the the, the outgoing uh, governor of Bank of Tanzania, was the executive director of ARC as well. Um, and then the presentation will be by um, Professor Bernard Hockman. And also this is research, uh, ARC research, again funded by uh, the African uh, stakeholder. And Bernard, we are very happy uh, to have you here. And then I'm going to turn this over to you, Governor. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, by the way, we have a discussion here. Um, 
I heard that uh, yesterday I was told that he may not show up, some, but somebody told him that he showed up yesterday. Is the, uh, the discussion is um, Watera. Uh, is he in the room? Uh, yeah, very interesting background. He's a director of integration, Africa integration, Cote d'Ivoire. And um, Charles, Charles, are you here? Is he, has he arrived? He's not. Okay, then we'll have more time for audience discussion. <laughs> let's, let's proceed. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, good yeah. morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. well, let me start by uh, mm -hmm. thanking the ARSC and in particular Professor Lema and your college mm -hmm. for giving me this uh, opportunity to preside over this morning session. Uh, it is a great honor to me. Well, together with me, I'm flanked by a prominent professor, Professor Bernard, who fortunately shares my name. <laughs> it's a professor and director of global economics at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies of the U European University Institute in Florence, Italy, where he has been since 2013. Previously, he was a director of International Trade Department and research manager in the Development Research Group of the World Bank. He served as an economist in the General Agreement of Trade and Tariff Secretariat during the Uruguay Round of Trade Negotiation. A graduate of Erasmus University, Rotterdam, he holds a PhD in Economics from the University of Michigan in the United States. He is a CPR Research Fellow where he co-directs the Trade Policy Research Network, a senior associate of the Economic Research Forum for the Arab countries, which are Iran and Turkey, a member of the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on International Trade and Investment, is a senior, senior fellow of the Center for International Governance, Innovation, and a member of the UK Trade Police Observatory Group. He currently serves as a chairperson of a high-level board of experts on the future of global trade governance, a Bertelsmann Foundation initiative. He has published widely in the area of trade and development, trade and service, international regulatory cooperation and the multilateral trading system. Professor Bernard, may you ascend to the podium. See you light. Okay. Yes. Could I have the presentation? Yeah. So it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here. As Lena said, this is uh, work in progress, and he was actually a bit too insistent that I present the research we're doing. So what I'm going to present is essentially kind of an amalgam of a lot of past work, ongoing work, and I'm very kind of eager to hear your reactions to, to what I'm going to say because it will help influence what we're going to be doing and working on over the next few months as part of this AERC project. So my topic today is services uh, and in particular with a focus on services trade policy and, and regional integration. I have put regional here in quotes because a lot I think of what the agenda really revolves around in terms of services and services policies are not necessarily um, it's not necessarily an agenda where you're trying to do something 
in a preferential way with a neighboring country, it's really more about what, are, what is the appropriate domestic services trade policy. And the real question is, what can you do in a regional context to actually pursue uh, domestic policies that will actually achieve development objectives? So let me just start with, with some of the, what I've called here, stylized facts. And I, I want to stress these a bit because this is all, I think, quite different from what we've been talking about yesterday, which was about industrialization, it was about infrastructure, it was about a different type of agenda. And I think one of the things we need to bear in mind when we think about what do our economies look like today, essentially most economies are either already services economies or are rapidly becoming services economies, in the sense that more than half of our GDP really is generated by the services sector. So. <clears throat> Given that a large part of our economies are services driven, that means if we're interested in economic growth, if we're interested in sustainable development, we really need to think about services, right? Because if half or more of your economy is services, if we start focusing on sectors which are important, like manufacturing or agriculture, we're going to be missing a big part of, of the story. Uh, one of the things I'm going to stress is that services are important not just because they're a large part of GDP, but also because services are inputs into production, right? So if you think about farmers, if you think about industries, they reuse a lot of services inputs. So if you think about how can you improve productivity of manufacturing, of agriculture, you're inherently going to have to think about how can we actually improve the productivity of the services sectors because that's going to help determine what happens downstream. And this, I think, is something that tends to get neglected in policy discussions where the focus very quickly becomes sector specific and we're not thinking about these linkages. Another thing I'm going to stress uh, is that services are important from the perspective of the sustainable development goals, right? So we as economists, we tend to focus on, on things like productivity, uh, but in practice, if you think about what is it going to take to achieve the sustainable development goals, you very quickly come to the realization that this is very much about services, right? So obviously, if we're talking about health or education, we're talking about health education services. But one of the things I'll show you is some preliminary research that shows that services policies actually have a direct bearing on the realization of the sustainable development goals. So just some st statistics very quickly. So this is just a snapshot of what's been happening to the share of services in GDP. Among African countries, uh, there's a subset, you probably can't read it, I certainly can't read it, but essentially the, the, the picture here is that there's an increasing trend of the services share of GDP. Uh, the dotted line somewhere in that graph gives you the average for, for Africa. Uh, the, the dotted red line at the top is where the high income countries are today. Right? So on average, we're looking at something around 50% of GDP and, and, a, and a ratio that has been growing uh, relatively rapidly. The other, I think, in, interesting fact to, to bear in mind with respect to uh, Africa and including the East, East African community is even though the share of services in GDP is, is significantly lower than it is for high income countries, even though it's been growing fast, the trade share is actually quite high. So if you look at the ratio of trade uh, to GDP, uh, for services, the so services trade ratio to GDP, it's, it's not that different from what you see in actually high income countries. Now, these numbers, as you can see, they bounce around a lot. Uh, the trade data is notoriously bad when it comes to services. But I think, again, the stylized fact to keep in your mind is that there's actually already quite a bit of trade and services happening. So that also suggests that maybe from a comparative advantage perspective, this is something where uh, African countries really should be focusing on because to a, to a significant extent it's already happening. Just This is a slide which looks at what actually is the, the composition of value added in manufacturing and again simply to illustrate the point that if we're interested in boosting manufacturing production, uh, manufacturing productivity, we're going to have to think about services because these services are all inputs into manufacturing. So on average, about a third of all manufacturing value added actually represents services inputs that have been used by firms that actually produce uh, goods. And again, there's a breakdown here across different manufacturing sectors, how services intensive they are, but the general picture again to keep in mind is that services matter 
for manufacturing. And this is another way of kind of making the same point uh, using input-output data uh, that has been collected <coughs> for a large number of countries. And one of the things you see is that forward linkages are much more important when it comes to services than it is the case for goods. So essentially, a lot of the services that actually are produced in an economy are actually used in production somewhere else. And that production might be in agriculture, it might be in manufacturing, mining, and of course, other services industries. So again, from a productivity perspective, that implies you really need to think about what are the policies that affect productivity and services because they will affect overall aggregate productivity. So there's a fair amount of empirical literature that I'm not going to take you through here today, but I think here the main point I would like to stress is that this link between the efficiency and productivity of services sectors and overall aggregate productivity is something that comes out of a lot of the literature. Uh, there's a lot of evidence for this, and in particular this, this effect on downstream manufacturing is something that is quite robust that comes out of a lot of analysis. Uh, what I'm not going to talk about a lot here today, but I'll just simply mention it, there's also quite a lot, an increasing amount of research being done on what happens inside services sectors and what does that actually, you know, how does productivity uh, increase within the services sector, what are the, the mechanisms uh, for that, and again what comes out of that is that is very much a story of partly information communication technologies, but to a large extent this revolves around the business service sector. So business services, professional services, are in a sense the transmitter of a lot of the knowledge, the new ideas about how you might do something more efficiently in, whether it's agriculture, manufacturing, it doesn't matter uh, what sector we're talking about. And the other thing that is increasingly a focus of research, again from a services perspective, is what is called servicification. Right? So increasingly, if you look at large manufacturing companies, um, and you look at what are they actually getting their profits from, a large share of those profits don't really come from making the widgets, they really come from providing a stream of services to their clients. So the main takeaway here for me, and I think this goes back to our discussion yesterday, that if you're thinking about industrialization, you're thinking about manufacturing, essentially what you need to be thinking about is services, because a large part of the value added of those companies really are associated with them either providing and selling services to their clients, or using the services to produce the goods and services that they sell uh, to their clients. So as, as I mentioned, in terms of the aggregate trade statistics, they suggest there's already quite a bit of trade in services among African countries, between African countries. Uh, there is not a whole lot of research on what actually happens. Uh, there is some case study evidence that has been done by a number of researchers and by a number of organizations, UNCTAD, um, the World Bank uh, are examples. And what those case studies show is that there's actually a lot of demand for trade and services. So on the one hand, we actually see a lot already happening, but the demand is a lot higher than what we're actually seeing. And one of the things that comes out of a lot of the case studies is that there are significant numbers of barriers to cross-border trade in services, which are either forcing that trade to become informal, limiting the scope to actually increase the size of this trade, so it's preventing investment, uh, realization of scale economies, um, and all of that, of course, has implications for the productivity performance of those services uh, suppliers. Now, one of the complications, which I'm going to talk about um, a bit more in the course of this presentation, when it comes to thinking about what impedes trade in services, is we have traditional trade policy instruments at the border, right? So we have, essentially, you could have a ban on the provision of a service by a foreign services provider, but a large part of this agenda really revolves around regulation, about licensing, about the ability to actually provide a service because, for example, there's a professional association that might say that if you want to perform legal services, you need to be approved by the bar of our country. So, so there is a very complicated mix between explicit discriminatory policies and things that are done either by the industry or the sector association themselves, and invariably, depending on the sector, there's also a lot of sector-specific regulation. 
So people who have tried to estimate services trade costs have come to the conclusion, which is not all that surprising, that services trade costs are very high, uh, much higher than trade costs uh, for goods. And I think one of the interesting things to me of this, uh, and these are just data that estimate what are services trade costs for different types of services across a large number of countries. One of the things you see is that there isn't much change in those services trade costs over time. And I don't have a graph here on this, but if you look at what's been happening to goods, you actually see trade costs for goods dropping quite steadily over time as a result of, of technological innovation, but also as a result of, of various trade policy related uh, reforms. So one of the reasons we see much less in the way of trade and services is simply because those costs are high. And if you say, why are those services trade costs high, which gets us into the agenda of regional integration, because there the question is, what proportion of those high services trade costs have to do potentially with infrastructure, have to do with particular policies, or do they simply have to do with the fact that services are much more difficult to trade? Right? You can't really pack up a service and send it across the border to a client. Uh, quite frequently what we're talking about when we're talking about services trade is people have to move across the border or you actually have to establish in a market to provide services, right? So you have to invest, so you have to then deal with if there are barriers uh, to entry. So unpacking those services trade costs is an ongoing agenda uh, for research. And one of the things that is the, very much the focus of that research is to unpack discriminatory types of policies, which say we're going to make it more difficult for a foreign supplier to sell a service to our consumers to unpack that and differentiate that from regulatory types of policies that apply to everybody, right? So it doesn't matter if you're a Tanzanian service provider or a Ugandan or an American or a Dutch one, the same rules will apply to all providers. But the fact that we have different sets of regulation that apply to services across countries increases <coughs> trade costs, right? So regulatory heterogeneity is one factor that underpins some of these trade costs, and it's an ongoing research program to really identify what's the relative contribution of each of these different potential factors. So what I'm going to speak to now is really more the discriminatory side of policy because that's one of the direct areas of engagement if we're thinking about regional integration, is to try and reduce the barriers to trade in services that have to do with discriminatory types of restrictions. And here, one of the interesting uh, facts uh, is that Africa is actually relatively open when it comes to services trade. So what this, this graph shows you, this is an exercise that was done by the World Bank a few years ago and which is now being updated by the WTO in cooperation with the World Bank, where essentially they're mapping the legal regimes that apply to trade in services. So essentially they're going through the legislation and they've asked lawyers to say to what extent are there discriminatory provisions which prevent, let's say, accountants from a foreign country to provide their services in country X. And what you see is that, therefore, in terms of the, the legal environment, the texts, uh, the policy environment, at least on the books, Africa actually jumps out quite well, right? So we have relatively low uh, services trade restrictions. The one thing you can see from this graph, if you look across the different regions, right, and Obviously, this reflects national uh, types of policies. You see, one, a huge amount of heterogeneity in terms of how restrictive policies are, but you also see a lot of variation across sectors. Right? And the one sector that invariably tends to be the most restricted is the professional business services sector. So here we're talking about accountants, lawyers, architects, engineers. Uh, those are <clears throat> something you see across all countries as being the most uh, restricted. But in areas like finance, transport, you probably can't really read it. Um, there isn't a whole lot in terms of formal discriminatory policies in place in many uh, African countries. Now again, as we heard yesterday, we really need to make a distinction between the law and the application. Implementation is of course a different story, but I think it's important to bear in mind what, what the formal situation is. So, the question then is, if we're talking about regional integration, and regional integration by definition revolves around removing barriers to trade, including for trade and services, 
the question is, how much does this matter, and how much attention should we be focusing as policymakers to this agenda as opposed to other dimensions of regional integration, right? And I'm going to just briefly take you through some research we've been doing that tries to get a handle on that question, and part of getting an answer to that question revolves around taking seriously the fact that services trade occurs through different channels, right? So we have cross-border trade, which can happen through uh, the internet, through telecommunications, types of technologies, uh, but we also have to take into account that a lot of services requires the movement of a service supplier across the border, and that might be temporary, that might be long-term. <coughs> here, one of the things that comes out of, I think, now quite a large body of research, which uh, I think has come to rather robust conclusions, is that although the technologies are changing very fast, so cross-border trade is becoming easier from a technological perspective, what, this, what the data are telling us is that foreign direct investment really is the major channel through which you get access to services. So that, that is the major channel through which you get access to new technologies, to new ways of doing things, uh, giving kind of greater variety of services to uh, uh, firms in your country, right? So that suggests from a policy point of view, you really then need to focus on what are the barriers to establishment of firms, what might impede uh, investment by foreign services providers uh, in the market. And I think here again, I would stress that, and this is why, again, I put the regional in parentheses in the title of my talk, is much of that new technology is going to come from the rest of the world, right? So you really want to then think about how do we attract that technology into our markets, and that really revolves around how foreign investors then perceive the market. So just uh, some research kind of findings in terms of this question, how much do these services trade restrictiveness indicators actually matter for things that we care about? This, this is the result of um, a gravity regression, which essentially asks the question, so what is the impact of these services trade restrictions on trade in goods? Now you might ask, why are we looking at trade in goods? One reason is we have much better data on trade in goods than we do on trade in services. But also it's to get a better sense of how important is this indirect effect of services performance on the performance of other sectors. So essentially, implicitly what we're asking here is if you have relatively high barriers to trade in services, that should impede the ability of firms in a market to actually get efficient services or to get low cost services. And therefore that should then be translated into kind of a more um, a negative productivity effect on those firms and that might impede their trade. So essentially what we're seeing here, and I'm not going to take you through all of, all of the analysis, but the, the bottom line that comes out is that services trade restrictions actually have a negative effect on goods export performance, trade performance, and that a large part of that has to do with foreign direct investment, right? So if you say we divide the barriers to trade in services into two parts, barriers to cross-border trade and barriers to foreign establishment of services companies in markets. It's really the FDI side of the story uh, that dominates. And that, you see that in, this, in these results here, the sort of the red circle results. <coughs> and just to kind of extend, this is a kind of ongoing work. So again, uh, this needs to all be taken with the grain. Um, of salt, but another dimension of this question of how do services trade restrictions matter is to look at these productivity effects, right? So insofar as the theory suggests that high barriers to trade in services will reduce the productivity of services in a country, so therefore manufacturing companies will have less, they'll become a bit less competitive or a lot less competitive depending on, on the situation compared to um, their competitors in other markets which might have more efficient uh, services sectors. So essentially here what we're going to be doing is we're going to be saying, okay, if we take seriously the results in the literature that suggest a lot of the action is through foreign direct investment, through the, the ability of foreign services firms to actually establish in the market, how does that then play out in terms of the productivity effects? Uh, of, of these services restrictions. 
but taking into account here the institutional environment, right? Because there's a lot of literature, of course, that suggests that foreign investors are going to be affected by explicit policies that may or may not allow them to be in a market, but they're going to be worrying much more about the investment climate, the business environment, uh, governance types of indicators. So one of the things we're doing in the research is to say, to what extent is the effect of services trade restrictions, which again is important for the regional integration agenda because we're going to be trying to remove those, to what extent is the effect of that removal going to be conditional on the institutional environment that prevails in, in different countries? So that's essentially what we're doing uh, here in this, uh, this is the result of that type of exercise. And essentially what you can take away from this is again, this result that services trade restrictions actually have a negative effect on productivity performance of downstream firms, of manufacturing firms, that is, that comes out of this type of analysis again. But what also comes out is that it's heavily conditional on the institutional environment, right? So the quality of governance in an economy is actually going to determine to a significant extent how large the gains are going to be from reducing these services trade restrictions. And again, these are just some results for some of the countries we have in the data set. Um, and what they do, what we do here is we kind of say, what is, <coughs> The first column here is what's the effect of removing the services trade restrictions in those economies on manufacturing productivity in that country? And essentially here we've just reported the results for the largest manufacturing industry in that country. And then we say, well, let's take as a counterfactual what would happen if we had the institutional environment of the best performing country in Africa in place or in a completely pie in the sky scenario, what would happen if we take the best country in the world with respect to governance? What is the effect then? And what you see is, perhaps not surprisingly, but that the effects of services liberalization go up dramatically if you're in a better governance type of environment, right? And what that suggests, I think, from a policy perspective, from an integration design perspective, is that the focus shouldn't just be on trying to reduce explicit barriers to trade and services. You really need to then also focus on sectoral regulation, the governance situation that affects the ability of, of these services providers to work. And at the end of the day, of course, if the, the governance environment is bad enough, you're not going to get investment at all. So therefore, what the analysis is also suggesting, you can do whatever you like in terms of removing services trade barriers. You're not going to get much of a productivity improvement from doing so. So again, this complementarity between the trade policy environment for services and the institutional environment is something that is coming out of a lot of the analysis uh, that we've been doing. Uh, just again on do these things matter? Uh, so again, implicitly, how much attention should you be focusing to services in the context of trying to integrate markets? Just some preliminary results again with respect to uh, what I mentioned earlier, the services, uh, the sustainable development uh, agenda, and this you definitely cannot read because the font is horrible, but essentially what we've been doing, and again, this is very simple and definitely way too simplistic, but it's gonna get a sense of, does this matter, right? Does this agenda matter for the things we care about and what we've done is we, we very simply said, okay, we have a number of sustainable development goals that have services components, right? There, there's a big services agenda underneath each of these goals. And we're simply then running a regression that says, do the services trade restrictions that we have information on, do they actually impact on the performance of, of those sustainable development goals? And the answer is yes. And it's actually much stronger than I had expected because here we're really looking at services trade restrictions and those actually have an effect on the realization of you know, access to finance, maternal health, uh, what do we have here? <clears throat> Income inequality, gender equality, uh, access to water. So what, what, what again that is telling us is that the services part of the SDGs are important and that trade policy can actually help improve the performance of those services sectors and therefore help attain some of the SDGs. I will skip over this because this is even less easy to read. But again, those slides were essentially just 
doing the same exercise, saying how conditional is this on the institutional environment, and what comes out of that re result, and again, I should emphasize, this is all very preliminary types of research, is that the one sector where this seems to matter the most is, is finance, financial services. So in the financial services sector, we have a very strong kind of link in terms of access to finance, where there is a strong link with services trade policy, uh, but we also have that link to institutions, uh, which is, is much stronger than for other sectors. Okay, so let me now try and get a bit more practical in terms of the regional integration agenda, which I've put here under the heading of facilitating uh, trade in services. Uh, so one thing I would emphasize, as you might expect, given everything I've been saying so far, is that this agenda really should not neglect services. And I think the stylized fact for me, certainly from observing not just integration efforts within Africa, but more generally globally, um, is that services tends to be a bit of a, of a stepchild. Right? So the focus is very frequently on agriculture and on manufacturing, and we're really ignoring the very large share of the economy that is going to help really determine the extent to which we can improve aggregate productivity, uh, aggregate growth. So don't neglect services. And I think if you look at what is happening in terms of the objectives of regional integration, in Africa across the different regional economic communities, I think that's certainly not the case. So we do have services as part of the agenda for regional integration efforts. There's a number of priority sectors that have been identified in the EAC, for example, where governments have said we want to make progress in those sectors, and they include important sectors like business, professional services, transport, tourism, communications, but I would argue that it's very important to go beyond just focusing on those particular sectors to really take much more seriously this, this linkage effect, this interdependence effect. So instead of just focusing on particular services, you need to kind of think about in terms of prioritizing what services to focus on, which ones are going to have the biggest effect on other parts uh, of the economy, right? And that requires analysis. I think that's the kind of work the AERC can and should be doing, but all of that to say is that I think the services agenda should be a core part of the regional integration efforts. Now, one way I think of making this a, a bit more concrete in terms of operationalizing and uh, moving forward on integrating services markets and to make it less abstract <coughs> is to say, we've all agreed and we all know that trade costs are something we want to Remove, And we all know how long it takes to ship a container from A to B, and that's really become the focal point for a lot of efforts to reduce those costs and to actually use the regional integration effort as a way uh, of doing so. So I would argue that one way of, of kind of giving more attention to the services agenda uh, in the regional integration effort is to tie it much more to the trade facilitation uh, agenda. Right, so there is now a concerted focus on trade facilitation, I think, uh, in many countries, uh, partly driven by this type of analysis that has shown how important trade costs actually are in terms of uh, impeding the ability of African firms to compete uh, on global markets. But if you think about what is trade facilitation, trade facilitation is, of course, much more than trying to reduce the red tape at borders. Right, so it, involve, it involves logistics, it involves transport, it involves uh, finance. So one way of thinking about kind of pursuing a services reform, services integration agenda, is to put it in the context of, of trade facilitation, uh, because that will also make it more kind of concrete for economic operators uh, in terms of why this is actually something that needs to be done, why it's important, beneficial, for them. And again, I would emphasize that should include a focus on, on foreign direct investments, which is essentially investment facilitation, right? And there has been discussions on, on investment facilitation, which I'll come back to uh, in a minute. And it very importantly should include movement of services suppliers, right? And again, the visa issue was mentioned uh, yesterday. Uh, clearly, that is an important part of this process. And certainly all of the case studies that I referred to a bit earlier invariably kind of focus on the difficulty of services suppliers to actually move across borders to provide their services. So that, that is, again, 
one way of, of arguing that this is something which is an important trade issue is to say this is really part of the trade facilitation uh, agenda. As I have stressed, I think, <coughs> If you're thinking about what do you actually do in terms of integrating markets, the services agenda is much more complicated because invariably you're going to be dealing with regulatory types of policies, right? And these regulatory policies are not intended to be discriminatory. They simply raise trade costs. And here I think if you look at the EU experience that we discussed I think already a bit yesterday, that shows how difficult it is to actually deal with this regulatory agenda, to deal with the fact that different countries have different ways of regulating uh, services sectors. Um, I think where you need to start then is, is to, there, there's two ways of then approaching, approaching that particular challenge. On the one hand, it's by getting together and actually looking at this at a sector by sector, uh, on a sector by sector basis, what actually would be good regulatory practices to achieve your objectives, right? And I think if you sit around the table and you, and you bring in regulators and you ask them, what have you actually been asked to do by your parliaments, by your governments? What's your mandate? Many of them are going to have the same mandate. They might be doing things in different ways, but essentially the end goal quite frequently is quite similar. So one thing that has been done in other parts of the world is to try and actually identify what are good practices in a particular area and converge on adopting those practices in the future. Right? So that's essentially a forward-looking agenda. It doesn't imply any kind of changes to current policies. Uh, it just says, okay, looking forward, we're going to really try and cooperate much more so that we are on the same page in terms of what we do in a particular sector. And I think here there's a lot to be learned from initiatives like APEC, um, the EU, where mechanisms are actually put in place to do that, right? And that's, it's my sense, and I'm, I would be very happy to be corrected, is that we don't really have that type of a, of a mechanism uh, in Africa <clears throat> in terms of bringing people together to actually talk about these issues in the context of regional integration. So I think that's one dimension of facilitating services that I think is quite important. The other dimension revolves around, okay, what do you do with current policies? So what do you do with the fact that there is a lot of regulatory heterogeneity uh, in place? And here the challenge, I think, in, in kind of achieving regional integration is to say we're going to accept at least some of that uh, heterogeneity. So we're not going to go down a path where we're going to try and harmonize any, everything. And I think that's one of the lessons of the European experience where that was tried and that simply didn't work uh, very well, right? So that's a very cumbersome, long process. So it it's really revolves then around putting in place systems where, <clears throat> again, the focus would be on where do we share common objectives and what can we actually do to ensure ourselves that we feel comfortable enough that you are doing enough to actually attain those objectives that we will accept the cross-border movement of services providers, even if they have been kind of subject to different forms of, of regulation. And again, I would argue that this calls for, this is not something you can do top down, right? this is not something where you can force the regulators to do it. It really requires deliberation, consultative mechanisms, working with each other to establish a trust, and trust is very much conditional actually knowing what other countries uh, are doing. And clearly this might all seem a bit pie in the sky. Uh, because there is, I think, an important political economy dimension to all of this that we need to recognize, which is that there are interests uh, at stake who, of course, benefit from, from, from these restrictions to entry into services markets. So here, I would argue that, again, one of the lessons from actually moving forward on integrating uh, particular services markets really is conditional on making sure that you actually have constituencies who say this is something that really matters to us, this is something that is going to make a difference uh, to us. <coughs> and here again, I would go back to all of this research that shows that really the big effects of, of services, productivity, services barriers, is really on the firms that use those services. Right? So, and this is something that they frequently don't, 
if you talk to them, of course, they will immediately say yes, of course, but it's not something that really gets used very much in the political economy of trying to identify what should we be focusing on, and that requires analysis, right? And that brings me, I guess, back to, to the AERC, where you actually need to identify where is that the case. So partly you can identify clusters of such types of activities through the type of consultative, deliberative mechanisms that I think really should inform the, the regional integration process. But that really cannot work, and that really needs to be supplemented by a rigorous analysis of what are these linkages, how does it play out, how does the fact that we're not allowing in foreign accountants or engineers or what have you, how does that actually feed through into costs, into availability of the type of services inputs that you know, your farming community, your manufacturers actually would benefit enormously from if they have that. <coughs> so again, that brings me back to these, what I would call, or what have been called knowledge platforms, which are essentially mechanisms where you can actually both put that type of analysis on the table, but also hear from stakeholders and participants, in particular supply chains. So one way of organizing this type of activity is through focusing on, on specific supply chains, where you can actually identify very concretely what the key constraints are, how changing those constraints might actually reduce costs for firms and actually kind of make more transparent the benefits. So one final uh, remark on this, which is a little bit off topic, but I think it illustrates the point uh, or, or the perception that I have is that services are really not being given enough attention, both from a perspective of regional integration, but I would argue much more importantly from the perspective of economic transformation, uh, economic growth. So there is a lot of attention being devoted to particular types of areas that revolve around services globally. Right? And the most recent effort <clears throat> was in the WTO, uh, where in the ministerial conference in Buenos Aires in December, a number of countries launched initiatives to say, let us not try and move forward with 164 countries, but let's actually move forward on countries that want to participate in a discussion on issues that matter to them and move forward on, on what is called a plurilateral basis. Right, so there were three concrete initiatives that came out of that ministerial meeting. One on e-commerce, which is very important to every country in the world, essentially the focus being on what can we do to actually identify what are good practices, where can we cooperate in this area to make life easier for our firms in terms of exporting to other markets. There was also an initiative on investment facilitation, essentially the same type of agenda. What can we do to facilitate investment in a way where we can also kind of deal with some of the externalities associated with tax competition. And then there's also an initiative on micro and small and medium-sized enterprises, which again is very important, of course, for developing countries where most firms are very small. Now here, I, what I would just put on the table is if you look at the African participation in those groups, it's almost non-existent, right? So we have, in the area of investment facilitation, we only have West African countries participating. Um, in the case, right, so we have in the area of investment facilitation, we only have West African countries participating. Um, in the case of e commerce, we only have Nigeria, and in the case of the micro and small enterprises, we only have Kenya. So to me, this is kind of an illustration of not really using these types of fora where you can actually learn about what actually would make sense uh, to do. So I'm just putting that out there as a question that I would argue we need a lot more engagement in these types of activities to actually identify uh, how to move forward on these services. That is kind of, let me stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, can we have Fernanda? Since we don't have a discussion today, uh, may I ask our all-time seasoned governor, uh, Dr. Karebu Fundanga, to open up and just say some few words before I open up the, floor, the discussion to the floor. Governor Karebu, please. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. First of all, I must thank the, our presenter. This is, uh, of course, a very complex uh, subject. And most of you are aware that during the trade negotiations do, do around, uh, it was easier to reach agreement on a number of issues relating to trade in goods. But trade in services, which is usually the delivery of intangible products has often been a complex uh, process because sometimes you can't even notice that a service has been delivered for which somebody has to pay. Uh, these days we, we do get consultants coming in with the computers and they deliver a service. So sometimes they can be based in another country. Information is just sent to them electronically and the service is provided which might cost even a lot of money. So when you are analyzing trade uh, between countries, it's often very difficult to really know exactly the quantum of transactions that have taken place in order to be able to cost it. Sometimes just bare estimates are used in order to just say something about what has taken place. Now, of course, uh, I, I didn't have much time to, uh, to prepare any comment on this issue. But I hope that I can provide just a lead on what I hope a lot of you can comment on. Given my background, my concern obviously has been trade in the financial services, which you have touched on. And, uh, but I can say that uh, there is a lot of uh, trade going on in financial services. And it's also an issue which has been of great importance to most of our countries because many of our people have been financially excluded. And an improvement in the financial services uh, would represent a, a big uh, opportunity for our people. Uh, luckily, in recent years, we have seen that through the use of IC, particularly mobile telephony, uh, I think we have seen that uh, it is possible to provide services to uh, our people in a way which had never been possible before. So we think that an emphasis on trade in financial services is very key to Africa's development, and uh, perhaps we could have, I would have loved to have seen more of that articulated in uh, this paper. Now, th uh, financial services are very difficult to provide, uh, as we have seen um, in a number of countries, uh, because there are a lot of restrictions. For instance, if we talk about mobile telephony, just the regulators, if a regulator can allow more mobile service providers to be established, it can lead to great improvements in the uh, services that are being provided. I think in the case of Tanzania, I remember the other year we were looking at Tanzania, which was not a leader in uh, uh, mobile money, but when they authorized more uh, service providers, uh, we saw a lot of competition and a lot of new innovations taking place. Uh, and I think East Africa has been a leader in this regard because Kenya, which has been a leader for a long time, now is competing very effectively, and we also know that uh, Rwanda, uh, even Uganda are also key players in this field. But all this has come about because of enhanced competition uh, in, in the sector. Uh, another good example one can give is money transfers. Uh, today it's very easy to transfer money, whether between African countries or uh, between uh, the rest of the world, because of uh, ICT. I know most of you have got children studying abroad. If your kid sends you uh, a small message that they need money. Within an hour, probably, they will be able to receive money wherever they are. They are. But this just shows how far we have gone in the financial sector. But I must also say that uh, cooperation among its regulators is very important. Uh, in this case, central banks, I think most of our countries also have uh, got ICT regulators. They must share information in order that everybody can benefit from emerging innovations um, in the field. But there are also a lot of restrictions, and I think for most bankers, the recent case of de-risking is one issue which comes to mind, uh, mainly arising from the developed countries where perhaps because of fears of terrorism financing or money laundering, they have uh, severely limited correspondence banking facilities for our banks, uh, particularly in the uh, developing world. And one would we hope that the various meetings that have been taking place can help to find a way of allowing African banks to have access 
uh, to prospond and bank status because if uh, this access is denied, it will have a very uh, negative impact on trade because when trade takes place, payments have to take place. And if banks are not allowed to transfer money to the US or to Europe because of this de-risking, uh, then it would severely impact on uh, the growth of external trade uh, for, for African countries. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I said, I, I wanted to concentrate my uh, comments on the financial sector, but I hope that with those remarks, um, others can pick it up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kaleb, and uh, we are always honored to be with you in the room. Uh, may I uh, take this opportunity now to open up to the floor? And as usual, I'll start from my right hand side, two questions, then at the middle, and to my left hand side. Uh, it is a question and answer session, so I wouldn't expect someone making another speech. Please, uh, be, yeah, uh, be direct and concise to direct your questions to Professor Bernard. Please, welcome. May I take any? Bruce. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess it's already clear what my, my point is going to be back. So I like the fact, the fact that Bernard, sorry, sorry, uh, Bruce Byers from ECDPM, also known as of yesterday as Emmanuel Macron II. <laughs> um, no, I, I find the point that Bernard was making that, that the, the service sector is sometimes ignored in these things quite a, a clear point, but I just wondered I mean, how helpful do you think it is to lump all these services together? I, mean, I think most of us are aware of the difference between sort of high productivity sort of telecommunication services and the fact that much of the servicification of economies is actually to do with low productivity services. And when they're all lumped together, then it becomes kind of difficult to see sort of what the analytical sort of benefit of that is. But also since at the end you talked about who benefits from the status quo. So again, the kind of political economy story to me, it seems that it differs a lot whether you're talking about transport uh, or tourism or education or the financial sector, where the sort of the interests and sort of the, the, the power relations are going to be quite different according to sector. So, sort of talking about service sector liberalisation, to me, kind of almost aggregates too much. If you're talking about transport uh, liberalisation, then I think you begin to get into something which is much more. So, I, wonder, I just wonder how useful you think it is to maintain this sort of broad uh, category. Thank you. Okay, let me move to the middle. Please, welcome, Chami. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I congratulate the presenter, uh, and even yesterday's presenters they did a wonderful job. One issue, that does not uh, appear to have been spoken throughout the discussion is the presence of uh, uh, block hubs when we have uh, SADIC, we have East Africa community, we have ECOWAS. Uh, we seem to have hubs in these uh, blocks. Uh, in yesterday's presentation, these hubs were referred to as swing states. But actually, they are the centers of attraction. They attract finance, they attract investment, and this investment is done in industry, is done in the service sector. Just like you were told yesterday, that the services follow industry. Now, when you have uh, an economic block, like SADIC, for example, where most of the finance goes to South Africa, the hub, and most of the manufacturing takes place in South Africa, the hub, and most of the service investment goes to South Africa, the hub, then what is left for the rest of the countries in the SADIC block? Uh, 
what, what do we get? I mean, these countries had the, some comparative advantage in industrialization, however small industrialization it was. But now, thanks to integration, even the little industrial progress that was there has now shifted. We think that politicians drafted these things in order to benefit everybody. But the politician is not the investor. The investor is the one who decides where to take his money. If I am a foreign investor, I in the SADC market, surely I will not go to Tanzania, I will go to South Africa, the hub. And then what does Tanzania gain from the process of integration? That's why, Mr. Chairman, yesterday we noted that there were some frictions between members of the same economic bloc. Why? Because of the feelings that someone is gaining, someone is benefiting more than I am. So, since this conference is about rethinking, are we, are we going to rethink of a way to bring about the, a better redistribution of the benefits of integration so that we avoid such frictions like the ones that we have heard since yesterday and even today, we have been told about the uh, barriers to service trade. Why? Because people are feeling that, you know, we, we are not benefiting enough from the, from the integration. So uh, what are we going to do? Are we going to rethink and advise our policymakers to go back to the drawing board and come up with a mechanism that will ensure that all members of an economic bloc really benefit. Yesterday also, Mr. Chairman, there was an example of successful monetary unions. It was given that uh, the United States of America and my own United Republic of Tanzania are examples of successful monetary unions. But we all know that this integration never came from, from below. They were actually imposed politically it was a political federation that brought about integration in, the, in America and in Tanzania. Are we going to maybe advise our policymakers that uh, they should rethink the process of integration and maybe start with a political federation before they go for this uh, free trade area, customs union, monetary, uh, monetary or common market? And finally, one issue that I've been waiting to hear from all the presenters is the Brexit. Brexit. I mean, most of integration uh, uh, processes in, Af in Africa are either based in the US or in the European Union. And Britain is, uh, as far as the European Union, is a superpower. She was a major colonial power on Africa. She is the head of the Commonwealth. And now this big power is leaving the EU integration. What does that say to us? If a major power like UK is leaving the EU bloc, what does Tanzania have to hope for? Or Burkina Faso for that matter? Or Rwanda? Are we going to I mean, what are we going to learn about that? And how are we going to convince our policymakers that it's okay, Britain can leave, but we remain in the integration process, in the blocks, and we are going to benefit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I ask you to introduce yourself? Because we didn't know who you are. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm Cyril Chami from the St. John's University of Tanzania, also a former Minister of Industries and Trade in Tanzania. To the former minister, uh, uh, may I take another question from this? So, oh, please, Governor. Thank you, moderator, and uh, thanks to. Bernard uh, for a presentation.
I would like to share the experience of, uh, of East Africa, because you wanted an example of where countries are coming together uh, on the liberalization of financial services within a regional, a regional setting. And then to Ooh, introduce, yes, my, oh, my name is uh, Luis Kasekende, Deputy Governor Bank of Uganda. Uh, what I want to share with you is uh, the case of uh, East Africa, where the politicians took a decision on the monetary union and the central banks have come together to facilitate the process of uh, lead, the process leading up to uh, the monetary union. We've had, we have meetings under the Monetary Affairs uh, Committee and we have agreed on a number of things. In fact, now we do have convertibility of, uh, of currencies among our, our central banks. We are looking at the payment system across uh, uh, the central banks. So that's an example that needs to be studied. But let me now come to the issues uh, Governor Caleb was talking about from our own experience. That's why I think uh, we need to think deeper. When all things are going okay, there is no problem. But uh, w there are challenges that we have seen. And I'm going to share with you uh, some two challenges. One is in the case where you've licensed banks, one Kenyan bank is licensed to operate in Uganda. If the home supervisor takes a decision on this institution, at that point they are more interested in resolving this institution at a national level and not the East African level. And there are times when they make take a decision that has an impact on you. Uh, in one case, without going into all the details, there was this data center which was in the home supervisor's country. And when they took the decision to intervene, the data center was not available to the subsidiaries. Okay? And what it has caused is that all of us are now going back, stepping back, and forcing the subsidiaries to have a data center in country. So initially we had wanted to reduce costs by depending on one data center. But because there is the likelihood that the home supervisor might take action and you may not have access to that data center, we have all stepped back and are now setting up, uh, uh, setting up data centers in country. The second one I think that you may want to share with us that I have uh, read about is the case where uh, in Europe they had allowed actually branches to set up, but deposit protection was at a national level. And uh, I think uh, there was the case of UK, some of the branches that had been opened up, where they were, the depositors in UK were not protected by a deposit protection. The third one is the one that has been raised by Caleb, where you license foreign banks to offer a wide range of services. And for one reason or another, in this case it is been mainly anti-money laundering, these foreign banks en masse withdraw the services and the integration into the global financial uh, system. And it is forcing some countries actually to think of having a national bank that you don't only depend on foreign banks, that you have a national bank that offers you the payments framework or system so that if the foreign banks withdraw, you still retain an integration into uh, the global. So the issues raised yesterday of nationalism versus regional, 
are also pertinent to liberalizing financial services at a regional level. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Bernard, for that excellent presentation. I have three questions. The first one is, when you look across Africa now, uh, IT is playing a huge role in education, uh, with distance learning, uh, e-learning, and especially for higher education. Uh, could you comment on that? Because that tends to be uh, highly cross-border. Uh, the second one is, what are your views uh, in trade in services as we move down this chain of new uh, technologies, for example, blockchain and 3D printing, which are changing the nature of manufacturing and the nature of business transactions. And then the last question is, uh, I really liked the charts that you showed, which showed the, what countries could gain in terms of productivity in the services area if they fixed certain issues on the institutional and governance front. If you turn the problem the other way around and say, because it takes time to fix governance and institutions, which services should countries focus on that would succeed in terms of productivity terms, even in weak governance and weak institutional environments? Thank you. Thank you. May I take uh, another question? Please, you're okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bernard, for the comprehensive uh, presentation. I'm uh, Amna Bakr from Sudan, uh, Secretary General of AMC. Uh, my comments is concerning the challenges, I think, uh, to determine the minimum standard of, uh, minimum standard of uh, services that uh, 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 secure uh, regional integration uh, is uh, important and uh, we need some analysis on how can we provide the minimum standard of services in different sectors uh, that uh, can, uh, uh, can, we, can we can achieve uh, equity in providing services for all uh, benefit countries in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, be, before I turn on the mic to Bernard, uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Kareb, do you want to quickly react to the discussion by Dr. Ruiz? I, not really as a reaction. I think what he has said tallies very much with what I, have, uh, I was saying, that it's important for regulatory authorities to be consulting each other if services are to benefit uh, the regions. Banks, have, I think, have already started mechanisms for, for them to meeting uh, in the regional uh, context as well as on the continental basis. I remember a few years back, we launched the CAPS, which is the Community of African Bank Supervisors, specifically because we thought that there is a need to share information on uh, uh, how we are supervising banks. So this kind of cooperation by regulators is very important. In a similar vein, as I say, cooperation by um, you know, those who regulate the ICT, which is becoming a very important backbone to almost anything we are doing, must be intensified so that if another country's uh, regulator is doing something good, the others can also benefit. And that's the only way we can ensure that we move forward. But let me also say that uh, at the international level, uh, services have become a key way of, by which we are now being controlled. I think most of you have, re have read the book, The Black Swan. Uh, in The Black Swan, uh, I think the division, the global division of labor is clearly defined where designs, even all these iPads, and so they are actually being done in America, but the actual production is taking place elsewhere. If you look at the sharing of the revenues between uh, the, uh, those who are designing and those who are producing, it's quite loop-sided. Uh, and uh, as, unless we catch up also uh, uh, becoming service providers, like having uh, young people in Africa design 
programs and all these applications, we could find that we are on the uh, wrong end of this uh, trade in services. But it, it requires education. We need to provide skills, the so-called STEM, science, technology, uh, you know, engineering and mathematics are very key areas which most of our countries are ignoring now and even universities are drifting towards, most of the universities are just providing uh, uh, MBAs. I think this will not do if we want to be key players. Uh, I think, may I take one or two questions before I turn on the mic to Bernard? Any interest from this floor? What about the middle? My left hand side, Bernard, you have the floor. Please welcome. Okay. I moved so quickly. Please welcome. Bonjour, euh, je m'appelle Deyaï Bukhari, euh, ministère de l'Emploi, de la Formation Technique et Professionnelle de la Mauritanie. Donc, j'aimerais euh, seulement poser une question euh, pour, euh, concernant le service de marché. Est-ce que euh, euh, je n'ai pas senti euh, au niveau de l'exposé de M. Bernard euh, l'aspect euh, de l'employabilité euh, euh, dans, son, dans, dans la présentation. Euh, je voulais euh, qu'il qu nous donne un éclaircissement sur, cette, euh, sur ce point-là. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Uh, any final question? Well, thank you, Bernard, again. You have the floor. Th Thank you for, um, for all the reactions, questions. So just to start with um, the points raised by Bruce, which I agree with completely. So it's always a real challenge when somebody asks you to talk about services and the services agenda, and we're talking then immediately about 50, 60 percent of GDP. You know, you obviously are talking about something which is way too aggregate. So uh, you really need to start drilling down into the individual sectors and of course that's where things should be <coughs> that's where attention should be focused so i agree completely with that and a lot of the research of course that is ongoing is is sector specific so the main point i was really trying to make is that one it really is important to focus on that whole services agenda clearly you need to unpack that and what i was trying to argue is that we're not paying enough attention to all of those services jointly uh, in, in a lot of these types of discussions. Now, but as the examples that were raised for financial, for the financial services sector, uh, you really need to drill down into those specific types of activities, and that is a necessary condition for identifying where there are these particular types of restrictions that uh, impede the ability of providers to actually do things efficiently, and identify where actually international cooperation can help. Right? And these examples that, that you mentioned with respect to, for example, the negative effects of anti-money laundering type of regulations, the de-risking effort, the, uh, the example of a country taking actions against a data center uh, which actually cuts off access to data that everybody else needs in other countries are all examples where this is where cooperation actually is a necessary condition for actually dealing with that because clearly Anybody that I've talked to who actually deals with data security uh, will tell you that it doesn't make sense to have national data centers in each country and that in fact actually makes things more risky as opposed to less risky. Uh, so partly this is again an exercise of, of re-establishing kind of the trust in a solution which will actually achieve the objectives of each individual regulator in a way which is more efficient and I think that's really an area where in, where regional cooperation can help a lot. But again, I think this, the, the sector specificity is absolutely 
critical, but what I would also argue is that these types of examples where you need to deal with something at the sectoral level also have impacts on a large number of different um, industries. And so I think that, that is, again, a, a dimension of this um, whole exercise which quite frequently doesn't get enough attention, and it goes back to the political economy. And again, I, I agree completely that it's going to be very different for specific sectors in terms of what the constraints are, in terms of what the solutions might be. But one thing that is common is it's going to affect a number of different industries. And all I was arguing is that we really need to do a better job, I think, of, of identifying who those particular groups are in order to actually build the, the political kind of support uh, for taking action in, in a particular area in terms of reducing uh, constraints. The, the point that was made about <coughs> essentially uh, within these regional communities that there's going to be one country or one city often that is going to attract a lot of the economic activity, <coughs> I think is something that is essentially a fact of life. So these agglomeration externalities are there. I would argue that when we think more about, about the services a part of the economy, those agglomeration effects may or may not prevail depending on what type of activity we're talking about. Right? So one of the things that technology is doing is it's actually really reducing the costs of distance and it's allowing people to provide services from a longer distance. So I think this is very much an open question, but I think the fact is, is that you know, we're going to see a large proportion of new economic activity being very concentrated uh, because of these agglomeration types of effects. And I think this, this actually bolsters, to some extent, the regional integration agenda because it means for people who are not in those countries to benefit from that type of activity, you know, they have to be able to move there. Right? So I think this goes back to kind of the, 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 the movement of people part um, of the story. But I think it's very much, if you look at a map of, of economies and you say, where does economic activity take place? Uh, if you look at a lot of the services activities are going to be dispersed across geographic space, mostly because a lot of those services are difficult to trade, so they're going to be local. So I think that gets me also to the employment question. Uh, a lot of the kind of, th there's obviously a direct relationship between the size of the services sectors and employment. Um, <clears throat> and I think one of the interesting features for me of, of thinking about integration of services markets and kind of liberalization of policies with respect to services trade is that the employment effects of that are in general going to be much less uh, acute than what we see in the case of liberalization of goods. So if we liberalize trade in goods, we're going to have situations where industries are downsizing, so countries specialize on the basis of comparative advantage, and certain activities that might have occurred because of protection are going to disappear or become a lot less. So that's part of where the gains from trade come from. So there are, there are acute distributional dimensions to liberalization of trade in goods. Now, if you, if, you, if you think about what happened in the services context, and again, I should emphasize that this is, of course, changing or is likely to change in the future, and that goes back to Franny's question, a lot because a lot more activities are going to be digitized and be able to be provided from long distance. But many services still today require a local presence. You need to be in the market, you need to be physically present in the market. So quite frequently what liberalization entails is that there might be a change in ownership, uh, but we're not going to see the type of really significant reductions in employment that you might have if you're liberalizing trade in goods. So the, the distributional dimensions of services liberalization I think are much less uh, problematical than they are in the case uh, of trade in goods. So that is one, and I think more generally, of course, in terms of just overall employment and where our employment opportunities going to come from, as economies become more services intensive, a large part of, of the share of new employment is really going to be affiliated with services activities as opposed to manufacturing types of traditional assembly type uh, of activities. Um, on Brexit, I think Brexit is, is quite specific. Uh, I think we have a few people who are 
much closer to this than I am in terms of why, why, why the Brits actually voted the way they did, but I think a lot of it had to do not really with the type of economic integration that we've been talking about uh, in this workshop, which really is about integration of product markets, goods and services, but it really had much more to do with the movement of people. It's really the integration of um, essentially the labor market, right? And that's really what people were voting against on top of a whole lot of other things where uh, I must confess, uh, I think is somewhat irrational uh, in terms of perceptions that they were being ruled by Brussels, etc. So again, this is a bit off topic, but I think politicians uh, in Europe have not done a very good job of defending what the European Union actually does and does not do. And it, in Europe, we tend to have a bit the same phenomenon you have in other countries. You need to point to an external institution for the problems you have, which are really things that should be done and, and can be done at the national level, which are not being done. So there's this notion of blaming Brussels for for things that should have been done uh, nationally. But again, I think the migration dimension is, is, is a very important one um, in the Brexit case. So again, I think these examples on financial services were very uh, interesting and um, appropriate. On, on Franny's questions with respect to, I think, you know, information technology, long distance type learning, um, this is where the future is to a large extent. So, and I think this is really where the challenge is looking forward. So we're not seeing too much of this now, but if you extrapolate that forward, I think a lot of the kind of positive noises I was making that services liberalization is not going to really have big effects uh, on employment. You know, those things might change quite a bit. Uh, so these agglomeration types of effects might actually get much bigger where you could have centers where you actually have a lot of these educational services being produced, but they're being sold in, in lots of countries um, with obvious implications for employment in those sectors in the importing countries. So I think that's, that's a bit uncertain how that is going to play out. But I think what is quite certain is that you mentioned 3D, blockchain, all these types of new technologies, they are going to result in a much more digital world, right? So again, I think the implication of, of, of a focus of policy on we need more manufacturing, we need to industrialize, I think that is, uh, you know, I think that is a bit outdated because it's really missing where the value added is being produced and the value added is not associated with assembling goods, the value added is really associated with designing those goods and increasingly with figuring out how can we digitize those goods so that we don't even need to uh, produce things locally. And that, of course, is where the 3D printing and additive manufacturing part of the story could have very significant implications for actually where do things uh, get produced. Um, on the interaction uh, question, so which services will work, where is services liberalization going to potentially work much better in weak governance environments. That's exactly what we're doing for this AERC project. So hopefully in six months time, I can actually tell you <laughs> something about what, what that research suggests. But that really is one of the questions uh, we're working on in an African context. So let me stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. And uh, you know, before we uh, close up this session, and since the Brexit questions, you know, emerged, can I have a quick reaction since we have two Europeans here, uh, Dr. Bruce and Chris? Uh, can, can we have, uh, yeah, can we start with, did you say Emmanuel? Please, Bruce. No, Bruce, Bruce, my friend. I, I, oh, <laughs> please, welcome. Reaction on just in the general, I mean, lessons. Well, okay, th when the point was made uh, that, that we haven't talked about Brexit, I guess the, 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 the question was more relating to what does it imply rather than what are the details of what led to Brexit, I guess. I mean, my, I, I would actually quite like to turn the question around and say, ask sort of for the Tanzanians, do you see Brexit as somehow? opening a door to breaking down of regional organizations? Is that something which is actually being sort of discussed in the Tanzanian uh, community or, or, or is it not seen like that? I mean, in, in a way I'm quite impressed 
that people attach so much importance to Brexit from the outside. I mean, I know it has sort of practical consequences in terms of trade relations, uh, especially in discussions of economic partnership agreements, and if the UK is not in the EU, then you're going to have to sort of renegotiate those. But it seems to me that the, 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 the issue that most people are talking about is almost the sort of the, the ideological effect of the UK stepping out of this organization and how that somehow opens doors for others as well. I mean, I read there was something recently in Jamaica. They also did a report recently to try and understand if in Jamaica they should be thinking about leaving CARICOM. What are the benefits? What are the costs? So in a way, I think maybe the Brexit story is sort of raising more questions, um, but I'm not sure if that, well, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, th I, th I think the dynamics are very different, so that's what Bernard said, so in a way we shouldn't draw too much from it, but I can understand why it raises all these questions, but at the same time I'm not sure it should be considered really a, a, a model, for example, of others to also say, right, time for us to get out as well. But then Thanks. let me allow Chris, Chris to give a more considered answer. what should be your reaction? Um, I guess my reaction is, is similar. I think there are a number of issues um, that we could we could raise. I think, um, and it's possibly quite quite interesting from a Tanzanian perspective, is um, Britain was always and has always been a reluctant European. The the, the history of, of Britain's engagement uh, with the European project has always been compromised, and it's compromised, or has always been uh, complicated, and has been characterised by a set of, of um, views about exceptionalism within within the, uh, the European um, with, within the European Union. The, um, you go back to the, the 1950s and, and 60s, and uh, Perhaps the famous, most famous quote around that time was from the U.S. Secretary of State Dean Acheson, who said, "The problem with Britain is that it had lost an empire but hadn't found a sense of purpose." And that that uncertainty about its engagement in in regional integration on, in its neighbourhood, I think, uh, has shaped an awful lot of the discussion and debate since. Um, that combined with the failure of its first attempt to join the European. Uh, commission that was uh, that was vetoed by um, the president of France shaped the the relationship, and arguably this what we've had or what we've seen over the last two or three years was um, in a sense still an internal debate within um, part of the British political establishment to resolve its own uh, views about Europe that led to a decision making process that that pitched a, a very complex and nuanced issue into a, uh, an outrageously simple binary choice, Europe in or out. Um, and what we're living through at the moment is, is, a, is a complicated process of what, what we actually thought we meant by that question. But, but that's, that's sort of the politics. I think Bernard mentioned the, the importance of, of the single market element and the issue of, of labor movement and labor mobility um, within Europe, which has certainly been seized upon as a proximate um, source of tension, which I think is, is an important one. Arguably, um, that can be traced back to a to sort of a policy error in, in the mid-90s, where with the accession countries joining Europe, the uh, position of the government at the time was to, to allow a complete liberalization of the labor market instantaneously. And uh, it turned out that the, the actual numbers of, of uh, people wanting to move to the UK um, were very significantly in excess of the projected numbers. And actually, this was a, a position that was different from that adopted elsewhere in the European Union that uh, created tensions at, at the local level it was exploited by a, a, a large section of the media that, that had a distinctly anti-immigration uh, anti position. And that then pitched the, the, government, the later government, the Conservative government, into this, into this uh, 
um, need to see off uh, its concerns over um, pressures on migration by promising a, a, a referendum. But I think, I think this is all sort of um, trying to understand how we, how we got here. Um, but I think, I think what Bruce says is really important. What, what is the perspective? Um, do, do people elsewhere in the world see uh, the, the prospect of British exit from the European Union really uh, as a sort of decisive moment in thinking about the, um, uh, the kind of future for deep regional integration? Um, is it just seen as one amongst uh, a number of events that uh, are the process of challenging um, globalization, the, the rise of nativism or the return to kind of economic nationalism around the world, whether it's elsewhere in Europe, with we saw in Catalonia, we see it in, in Scotland, we see it in various places elsewhere in Europe, this, this uh, retreat from uh, the grand political project. Um, how does that play out? I think it's a really interesting question to ask. How does that play out in terms of the political debate, uh, in, certainly in this part of the world as elsewhere? Well, thank you so much um, uh, to Bernard. Uh, I wish to thank you for the excellent presentation and deep reaction to the questions that were addressed to you. Can we have a round of applause to Bernard? Yeah, I, will, I wish also to thank Dr. Caleb, who turned actually to be our immediate discussant. Please, can we have a round of applause? Uh, another round of applause to our <coughs> colleague in the European Union. <laughs> and final round of applause to AERC for organizing the event. I, I, but I didn't, you know, I shouldn't forget you, the floor. Please, a final round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, okay, um, a final round of applause for our chair, Governor. Yeah, very skillful chairing. By the way, let me also remind you that um, this uh, senior policy seminar is being uh, hosted in partnership with the Bank of Uganda. We should also have a show of funds for Bank of Uganda. So um, I have noticed that um, we're actually cutting into the break. And then, and then I looked at the, uh, the lunch time, which is around uh, one something. So I was just wondering if, if I could actually propose a friendly amendment uh, to the schedule today. Uh, very, very minor. I think the, what I thought we should do is uh, come for the, this, uh, the ADB presentation immediately after the break. But I think that we could actually take an early lunch, maybe beginning like noon, and then come back at uh, 1 p.m. and do the round table. That is, if it's okay with uh, the chair of the round table, Louis Kaskin. If you are available at 1 p.m., I think that actually works out much better and we don't have to be rushed, um, unless there is a really kind of a very serious, uh, violent objection, uh, I hope that you would adopt uh, this friendly amendment, right? 